go. So let me just echo the comments before about um, uh, thanking the uh, organizers for uh, putting this meeting on. Quite an interesting uh, set of talks, and I'm looking forward to participating in them over the time today. So um, as Dr. Lecker mentioned, I am from uh, the University of Western Ontario. There's a picture of the campus, part of it over here. This is the Thames River, not the Thames River you know about, but it's the one in London, Ontario, in Canada. There's a lot of Londons around the world, and this is just one of them. So uh, I'm going to talk today about BRCA2 inhibition. Now, although I am discussing antisense technologies in order to target BRCA2, um, I'm talking about proof of principle. At the very end, I will talk about some therapeutic uses of uh, siRNAs that target BRCA2 to enhance sensitivity to DNA repair inhibiting drugs, and in that case, it's going to be Olaparib. And I'll talk a little bit about the in vivo applications of all of that. But really, I'm talking about targeting BRCA2 to enhance anti-cancer drug-mediated alterations in a whole variety of malignant characteristics of tumors, proliferation, metabolism, in vivo growth, and metastasis. So if we go on from there, if I press the right buttons, there we go. I want to talk a little bit about the problem that we're dealing with here now. Um, at the moment, targeted cancer agents are, for personalized medicine are the favorite approach to developing all kinds of new cancer therapies. And so this has been touted as the way of the future. Let's go for targeted therapies where we pick a target within cancer cells that we would like to knock down and that will sensitize cells to treatment or have a therapeutic, a therapeutic effect on its own. Well, while it's there, and, and, and when we think about those targeted cancer agents, we're thinking about, uh, traditionally, we're thinking about drugs of some known structure. It's going to target some molecule that's either found only in cancer cells or is preferentially expressed within cancer cells, so there's a therapeutic advantage of using them that mediates some kind of malignant phenotype. It's going to slow the growth of, or it's going to kill cancer cells but not normal cells, or will preferentially kill cancer cells one way or the other. The problem here is that it works in some cancers, but it doesn't work in others, and it tends to be relatively simplistic. It's true for some things like gefitinib or eresa, erlotinib or tarsiva, both of which are going to target mutations in the EGF receptor gene, or EGF receptor uh, protein. That works there, and for those that don't have EGF receptor mutations, the MT plus meaning mutated, think drugs like crizotinib, which targets EML4 ALK, can be used as well. So these are targeted therapies. Pick a very specific target in tumor cells, knock that down, and you'll end up killing cancer cells. The problem with this is, and here's the couple of examples I've given, are, given here for EGFR, thymidine kinase inhibitors, or crizotinib, you can see over here that when you take a look at the duration of benefit, you've got about a year for those that are targeting the EGF receptor, Uresa, for example. Or for crizotinib, you have a little over six months. But if you take a look down here at a whole series of targeted therapies, and you take a look at whether there's a cure, it's no, 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 all the way down. And maybe, for the poster child, imatinib targeting CML. Because you have a greater than five-year duration of benefit, so that might, in fact, be as good as a cure, even though it's actually a delay, a progression of the disease. So here's the problem behind limitation of targeted therapies to produce long-term cancer regressions. You don't get cures. You get uh, increases in progression for, sur for survival and an advantage in that uh, sense. There's a, and the problem behind all of this, why these patients do progress, even with targeted therapies, is that genomic instability and all the different inter- and intratumor heterogeneity events that occur because of that genomic instability is a key factor in mediating lack of effect for targeted therapies. Here's just one example. This comes from Charles Smyton's lab at uh, Cancer Research UK here in this London. And this is an example where if you take a look at kidney tumors, Here's a whole bunch of different regions, R1, R3, R5, R9, which were taken from the original kidney tumor. And you can actually take, in addition to the uh, primary tumor, you can take a look at metastases that are present in the lung and other parts of the body. And if you take a look at the intratumor uh, heterogeneity and phylogeny in one of these patients, 
and take a look over here, just to look at the gray. These are uh, the regional distribution of mutations. Here are the ubiquitous mutations that are everywhere. There's a lot of mutations that are present both in the primary and in the metastases, all these little gray squares that are over here. But if you take a look over here, the number that are shared between the uh, in the primary, even in the different regions of the primary, gets smaller. There's a whole bunch of mutations over here that are not shared between different regions, even within the primary tumor. And when you go over to the metastases over here, there's even fewer shared. And when you get to private mutations, there's dozens and dozens of private mutations that are present in each one of these individual regions where the tumor is metastasized or within the primary. You can take a look at a phylogenetic tree over here that uh, describes that. And if you look at ploidy profiling, just the number of chromosomes that are present here, you see there's differences in ploidy in different regions, R4, R2, and R9 that are present in the tumor here and in metastases. So tumors in the same patient are extremely heterogeneous. And if you want to pick a single target to hit in a targeted therapy, you're not going to hit all these different parts of the tumor itself or in the metastases that spread out from that tumor. A huge problem for targeted therapy. So intertumor heterogeneity can underlie underestimation of tumor genomics landscape particularly if you do a single tumor biopsy sample and often single biopsies are all you have to work on. And that's a major challenge to personalized medicine and biomarker development. And that intertumor heterogeneity it's a, that's associated with heterogeneous protein function is going to lead to some tumor adaptation and therapeutic failure of targeted therapies simply because of Darwinian selection. You can just simply select for all the resistant tumors that are present and they'll grow up uh, even when you have those targeted therapies that are treated. So, in the question of personalized cancer medicine, you started with one size fits all, some treatment that you uh, treat all tumors at a particular disease site with. Then you would move to a major subgroup and you'd have different treatments for subgroups. Then you get into the concept of each cancer is unique. So every patient is going to have a different treatment. A huge challenge to generating new treatments where you're going to be able to treat all patients. And it gets worse. Life is worse than that. Each cancer cell is unique. And here's the kicker. Next week, it's going to be unpredictably different. So even if you could find something that hit every cancer cell, it's not going to last for you. A week from now, a month from now, a year from now, the ongoing heterogeneity that's generated causes even more problems. So we're stuck in a bit of a rut here. So we tend to find a mutated oncogene and inhibit it. If that doesn't work, find another one and inhibit that. If that doesn't work, find another one and inhibit that. It's an ongoing, never-ending situation that we find ourselves in. So we've got a problem here. So what does that teach us? You can have some very spectacular targets that do exist, like the target for imatinib, for CML, in a small minority of cancers, and they may be druggable. So it's not without merit. But it's not curative, but the possibility of CML is an exception. The benefits don't last very long in the usual course of events. And the mutator phenotype is responsible for resistance to those targeted therapies. And it's very unlikely that we can keep on designing around resistance forever and keep on re uh, treating again and again and again. You're going to end up in a situation where you have tumors that are going to progress and lead to morbidities and mortalities in the patients that we just can't get around. So we need novel solutions of this kind of thing. Now, even though we've got a big problem here, there are uh, treatment opportunities based on the unique characteristics of cancer cells, all this uniqueness that shows up. Warburg-type metabolism is qualitatively different than it is in normal cells, and that leads to the uptake of huge amounts of glucose, for example, and treatments can be generated because of that uptake of glucose or other components that they have to eat to outcompete the host. And you also have massive generation of neoantigenic variants and in an immunotherapeutic context, that can be very useful to heterogeneity and neoantigenic variant production can be used immunotherapeutically, uh, immunotherapeutically. But what we're thinking about is the genome-wide chaos that induces heterogeneity can re uh, create an exploitable weakness in cancer cells. I'm going to talk about that for a few minutes. So cancer is an unusual organism. You have that chaotic generation of new variants all the time because of mutation. Cancer cells are in trouble because of that. They create that variation to survive, 
because of the heterogeneity that, and the advantage that gives them. But that massive mutator phenotype that's occurring in cells all the time means they have to depend on DNA repair to repair those events, and that's an Achilles heel, an exploitable weakness for cancer cells. So they're right on the very edge here all the time. They could fall over if you trip them up in terms of DNA repair. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So these are the DNA repair events that occur here. You have DNA damaging agents, DNA lesions occur, and then DNA repair has to take place down here, and there's a various kinds. The best kind that tumor cells would like to have is homologous recombination repair for double-stranded break and joining. And Thomas Helliday talked about this in translational cancer research in 2013, where he states that anti-cancer drugs can induce DNA damage, that gives DNA, that produces cell death. But the underlying DNA, underlying DNA repair status is going to be important for the efficiency of therapy. And you can develop resistance to anti-cancer therapies, and that, that can be, be explained by increasing capability of resistant cancer cells to repair the cytotoxic lesions. So if you can reduce repair in cancer cells, you can end up enhancing sensitivity to chemotherapeutic drugs. And tumor cells, if they, uh, uh, somehow get around that by increasing repair, you can reduce the heterogeneity in tumor cells so you can make targeted therapies work even better. So they can't work their way around this one, this kind of a targeted uh, treatment, uh, by, uh, 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 by generating uh, new heterogeneity. They have to re restrict and reduce their heterogeneity to do that. So tumor cells are inherently genetically unstable. Normal cells faithfully reproduce their DNA, and the amount of DNA damage accumulated in tumor cells is really close to the limit of tolerability. DNA damage in normal cells is further from that, that limit. So DNA repair molecules are therapeutic targets. The target we've chosen is the breast cancer uh, tumor suppressor gene, breast cancer 2. This is a really crucial mediator of error-free homologous recombination repair of double-stranded DNA. Here's the culprit here, BRCA2. It will bind to DNA through these oligonucleotide binding or OB folds. When that happens, they will displace replication protein A. These are the red circles that are over here. Replication protein A is one of the first proteins that will bind to double-stranded uh, uh, or single-stranded regions that surround double-stranded breaks within DNA. And when that binds, BRCA2, and only BRCA2, not BRCA1, has to come in bind to RPA, displace that, and allow RAD51, which is a recombinase that uh, is required for DNA repair, to come in and start the initial events of DNA repair. So BRCA2 mediates DNA repair. And very interestingly, BRCA-deficient tumors are actually more responsive to therapy, so that when, uh, for example, women develop breast cancer or ovarian cancers, because of mutations that they have in BRCA, so the incidence of tumors goes up, the tumors that they have are actually easier to treat. So that's the hidden benefit of having that kind of a disadvantage to begin with. Here's an example of that. We published this back in 2014. But if you take a look at BRCA2 mutations in endometrial cancer and in ovarian cancer, and look at disease-free or overall survival, the red lines up here, 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 and here are those who have mutated BRCA2 genes in ovarian cancer or endometrial cancer. The blue has wild-type BRCA. So you see that the disease-free and overall survival in both cases is decreased if you have functional BRCA. It's increased if you have mutated BRCA. Mutated BRCA leads to uh, uh, increased capacity to treat those diseases with existing therapies. And it's the BRCA2 mutations, not BRCA1. You don't see the events occurring in BRCA1 down here. It has to be BRCA2. So we're targeting BRCA2. That, we talked about before, was actually a form of synthetic lethality. So that if you have pre-existing mutations, you can pick those patients and you can treat them. But it's a very tiny subset. It's only about 5% uh, or less of patients uh, who have o ovarian cancers, for example, who have mutated BRCA2 that you can choose to begin to treat with drugs that target DNA repair, where you have a, uh, a treatment advantage with that. So we're talking about inducing synthetic lethality by knocking down BRCA2 and making that vast majority of tumors, which are relatively resistant to those DNA repair inhibiting agents, like olaparib, for example, 
um, and make them sensitive by getting rid of BRCA2, induce that synthetic lethality. So we're using antisense oligonucleotides to do that. I won't go into the details of how that works, but it's different than SI RNAs or small interfering RNAs because they recruit ribonuclease H. And the big difference is that <clears throat> the uh, antisense oligonucleotides that we have here are relatively stable compared to RNA, so they don't require a liposomal carrier to get them into cells. They will go into cells on their own without anything to protect them. They've got a very long half-life, and they also are catalytic. In other words, because of their stability, they'll cleave, in this case, BRCA2 messenger RNA, but then they'll go on to cleave a second messenger RNA molecule, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. So they have a catalytic ca capacity that sRNAs don't have. You can knock down BRCA2 messenger RNA, and you can also bra knock down BRCA2 protein, as you can see over here. And this is in cultured uh, human non-small cell lung cancer cells, the A549 cell line, just as one example. And you can see here that BRCA2 knockdown will reduce DNA homologous recombination repair. And if we take a look here, this is uh, A549 cell nuclei, DAPI stains, so that you can see them here. The yellow dots are RAD51 foci, which are indicative of DNA repair taking place. You don't have a, uh, an anti-BRCA2 ASO treatment here, no antisense targeting BRCA2. Treat with cisplatin, lots of repair taking place in these cells. Here you use a BRCA2 ASO to knock down BRCA2, and over here there's far less uh, RAD51 foci formation compared to here, and you can see that over here. Here's BRCA2 ASO with cisplatin, looking at the RAD51 positive nuclei. There's a big drop from here with the cisplatin treatment in both cases, but here the BRCA2 knockdown in combination with it. So you can reduce repair in these cells by knocking down BRCA2. That leads to looking at uh, proliferation in a number of cell lines. Here's the non-small cell lung cancer cells, ovarian cancer cells, breast cancer cells, just as some examples. The white circles are knockdown of BRCA2, and these curves are generated so that we're only looking at greater than additive synergistic effects, not additive effects. This is the enhancement of the capacity of drugs like cisplatin and melphalan to kill these cells. Huge enhancement of sensitivity to these, drug, to these drugs by knocking down BRCA2. If we took an HK2 cells, that's a human kidney proximal tubule cell line that's not transformed, that's not a cancer cell line, very little sensitization. CAPAN1 cells are human pancreatic cells that actually lack functional BRCA2, and there, because they don't have a target, there's no sensitization going on in there either. So we don't appear to be targeting, at least in these control cell lines, uh, anything, uh, anything other than uh, uh, BRCA2, and non-tumorigenic cell lines are not sensitized, but tumor uh, cell lines are. A lot of other cell lines. This just looks at the change in the IC50, the inhibitory concentration of 50, the amount of drug required to reduce proliferation by 50%. And to cisplatin and melphalan, I showed you the same is true for ionizing radiation. You've sensitized all of these guys, but not the BRCA null cells that are down here. So we've got a situation where knocking down BRCA2 can sensitize cells to therapies and, and, uh, and of all kinds. Now, I'm talking about induced synthetic lethality here, where we downregulate a factor that's important for resistance that will increase the sensitivity to that drug. There's another point that I just want to make very briefly, and that is that we can combine induced synthetic lethalities, where we can hit two different targets that mediate resistance to two different drugs, and then treat with the combination so that you sensitize synergistically to both of those drugs. This is the situation here where you've got drug X. You can use induced, induced synthetic lethality to sensitize to that by hitting one target. There's another drug with a different factor that mediates resistance. Induced synthetic lethality there. You can mix the two together, treat with both drugs, and have combined induced synthetic lethality. This is a bit of a complex graph here. And I've invoked something that I haven't had a chance to talk about, but we've published extensively on that. This is the target thymidylate synthase, or TS. That mediates resistance to 5-fluorouracil, and in this case, 5-fluorouracil deoxyribonucleoside, which is an active product of 5-fluorouracil. So we can use an antisense to knock down TS, sensitized to 5-FUDR, just as I talked about for BRCA2, 
and knock down BRCA2, which mediates resistance in this case to cisplatin, and enhance the effect to cisplatin, and then combine the two. Here's the situation with control. Here's the all control sRNAs, but treatment with cisplatin, treatment with 5-FUDR, you do reduce proliferation of the tumor cells. And if you mix the two together, you'll reduce it even further because you're hitting two different targets in the cells. But if you use BRCA2 sRNA and a TS sRNA, knock down both targets to sensitize both drugs, you end up with a huge sensitization to the combined treatment of both. So there's a combined synthetic lethality, individual synthetic lethality, induced synthetic lethality, and the original idea, just synthetic lethality alone, where you have to depend upon the pre-existing appearance of uh, knockdown of some kind of a target to sensitize to things. Here we're inducing that synthetic lethality. Finally, uh, BRCA2 treatment can induce a model metastasis in human A549 non-small cell lung cancer cells. Up here, this is a colony formation assay, an in vitro assay. And here we're looking at sensitivity, the number of foci that are produced after treatment with cisplatin with the white uh, bars here, that's treatment with a BRCA2 antisense oligonucleotide. The black bars, that's treatment with a control ASO. We can reduce colony formation in vitro to cisplatin and also to ionizing radiation and a number of, of other drugs that I haven't talked about here today. This is generally considered a model for metastasis, not a perfect model, but it's an in vitro model that uh, looks at some of the characteristics of metastasis because these individual cells have to lie down on the plate and form a colony, which is something a little different than just inhibiting proliferation of the cells as a whole. We've also reduced metastatic foci in a chick embryo choreoallantoic membrane assay or a CAM assay. In this case, we treat with the BRCA2 antisense oligonucleotide inject the cells into the vasculature of an embryonic chicken. And although I don't have the slide here showing the three-dimensional um, uh, uh, movement of the events that are going on here, this is a GFP uh, labeled uh, tumor cell line. In this case, it's the uh, A549 cells. And you can see these tumor cells that are sitting here. And if you could if I could show you the uh, picture rotating itself, you'd see that these are extravasating from the vasculature and forming a metastatic focus. And we can reduce the number of metastatic foci when we treat with both the BRCA2 ASO and the cisplatin enormously compared to treatment with the control ASO and uh, cisplatin over here. So we reduce metastatic foci by treating, by knocking down BRCA2 as well. Finally, this is a treatment in nude mice. Here, I won't talk about this, this is just the weight of the animals, but what we've done here is to take nude mice, inject them intraperitoneally with SCOV3 human ovarian cancer tumor cells, treat them in vivo with a control sRNA or a BRCA2 sRNA, that's actually with a liposomal delivery vehicle that we're working with in collaboration with Anil Sood at MD Anderson. At the, uh, and we begin to treat that uh, eight days later. And after eight weeks of treatment, we look at the number of tumor nodules over here or the total tumor weight that's appearing in the interperitoneal cavity. And you can see here that if we take a look at the number of tumor nodules, this is the BRCA2 sRNA plus a laparib. This is ex much, much lower than either the BRCA2 sRNA alone or the sRNA plus the laparib. We're sensitizing to the treatment with the elaparib over here. And if you take a look at the total tumor weight, all the tumors that we've taken out of the interperineal cavity were way down here with a BRCA2 sRNA plus elaparib versus the BRCA2 sRNA alone or the control sRNA plus the elaparib. So knocking down BRCA2 encapsulated in a liposomal carrier is going to enhance sensitivity to elaparib and that's done in an in vivo model in mice. So con in conclusion, we can see that human tumor cell heterogeneity is a challenge to therapy if you're going to target that uh, for targeted therapies because you have an ever-changing subset of tumor cells that you have to treat, and that's a huge problem. Cancer cell survival, when you have lots of chaotic events because of the high mutation rate that occurs in cancer cells, is going to depend on high fidelity repair of double strand breaks and crosslinks. So you have to have in cancer cells a very high rate of homologous recombination repair. And if you target that homologous recombination repair, you can trip up cancer cells. BRCA2 mediates homologous recombination repair and BRCA deficient tumors are res more responsive to this therapy. That's the old idea of synthetic lethality. 
therapeutic targeting of BRCA2 is going to induce synthetic lethality in D to DNA damaging drugs. And strangely, this is an idea that people are having a hard time grasping onto. People seem to haven't thought about this very much, which is why we came up with the concept of inducing synthetic lethality. And uh, you'll uh, enhance sensitivity to drugs like cisplatin, melphalan, ionizing radiation, and others. And you'll reduce model metastasis both in vitro and in vivo. So therapeutic targeting of BRCA2 and combined induced synthetic lethality in combination with thymidylate synthase can increase sensitivity to combination treatments as well, a greater, another advantage of induced synthetic lethality. And targeting BRCA2 and human ovarian xenografts can enhance sensitivity to the PARP inhibitor olaparib in vivo as well. So the message I want to leave you with is that targeting repair events is of enormous advantage in treating human tumor cells, or is potentially of enormous advantage. It's unlike targeted therapies because it hits the mutator phenotype itself rather than individual mutations that occur in cancer cells. And I think the idea of inducing synthetic lethality rather than relying on pre-existing mutations in cancer cells is of enormous merit, and combining induction of synthetic lethality across multiple treatments is also of enormous benefit. And with that, these are the acknowledgments here. And I do want to say Matthias Ritaluski, whose name you'll have seen along the way, is the very talented graduate student who's been working on this particular project. And here's some of the uh, uh, organizations, both private and public, who supported our work. And with that, thank you very much. And I'll answer questions if I can. Yes, the idea of knocking down BRCA2. Yeah, and what we have seen, yeah, this is an excellent question, the concept here is, of course, that if you reduce repair in normal cells, will that have potential to uh, kill those normal cells as effectively as it kills the cancer cells? That's a question one has to address. The HK2 studies, where we took a look at the human proximal kidney tubule cells, are suggestive, not conclusive, but suggestive that normal cells may not be as affected as a, at as high a rate as the uh, tumor cells. And in other studies that I haven't had a chance to describe here, we've taken a look at uh, cell cycle progression in both normal cells, the HK2 cells, and other endothelial cell lines that we've looked at versus cell cycle progression in tumor cells after knockdown of BRCA2. The uh, delay of cell cycle progression that takes place once you reduce DNA repair is very active in normal cells. Uh, in all of the normal cell lines that we've looked at, but it's not active in the tumor cells. So we do see a progression into uh, metaphase and then subsequent cell death, and actually the production of even more breaks and exchanges in the tumor cells than we see in the normal cells. And I suspect this is primarily because of the cap capacity of normal cells to have cell cycle checkpoint control of multiple types, the tumor cells generally lack, not always, but generally lack. Now, even if the uh, tumor cells, though, uh, have cell cycle checkpoint controls, because of their high rate of mutation, the heterogeneity that is, that is produced at a much higher rate there, makes them closer to the edge. So even if they can stop to try to repair as much as they can, they have accumulated so much DNA damage already that even a little bit more damage is going to push them over the edge. They'll drop off that spinning disk in a sense. In the normal cells, you might induce exactly the same amount of damage, but it's relatively far from that critical limit of damage that's um, uh, sustainable within those cells. So that's the theory that we're working on at the moment, and I think that's, where, that, that's likely to be the explanation that uh, would be the most plausible one, and most possible one. Yes? Uh, to follow up on that question, actually, um, Beyond the acute damage to the cells, uh, to normal cells, um, I was wondering if there is, if you've looked at increased potential for mutagenicity and secondary kind of malignancy that might arise, because you're targeting DNA repair in normal cells as well, and then adding 
a uh, DNA damaging agent. Right. In other, in other words, and this is an important question because, and I think this is, this is the question where people have tended to steer away from targeting uh, repair as the therapeutic intervention because you may end up inducing new lesions in the patients because if you induce uh, brachiness or induced uh, or lack of BRAC activity in normal tissues, then you can convert somebody with normal BRAC activity into somebody who has, in essence, a BRCA2 mutation or something like a BRCA2 mutation. So, for example, breast and ovarian cancers might arise at a much higher rate. And I think that's probably quite true. I suspect that would be a danger that one would have. But then one looks at, let's say, for example, a non-small cell lung cancer patient who might have uh, a life expectancy of, of months to a year or something like that. And then you suggest to them, you do have a risk of developing other cancers 5 to 10, 15 years from now. Well, the answer, of course, is uh, the relative risk one. Although what you raise is a very interesting point. This may not be a treatment that would be appropriate for tumors that are highly treatable by standard methods. Uh, it has to be those for whom the relative risk is much higher for the disease they already have. So there's going to be a threshold point where one wants to apply this kind of a therapy. An important question. Um, uh, James, uh, cisplatin, uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, just uh, uh, phosphorus tau A22. Basically, you know, uh, Kalmyron just uh, uh, published quite a few papers on Gebmer's uh, 434 that uh, basically showed much higher nuclease resistance compared to um, uh, anti-sense phosphatase and antrophenol metals. Um, yes, and, and, and that's an interesting observation for which I don't have an explanation. <laughs> because it's uh, duplex. Yes, that's right. For the, so, uh, and that's, you know, I really have no particular explanation about exactly why it is working that way. Um, for, uh, and I think they were using antisense oligonucleotides for their treatment, were they not, when they did that? If I, am I right when I suggest that? Um, uh, one of the difficulties with the antisense oligonucleotides that ISIS has been talking about recently is the delivery of those to non-reticuloendothelial uh, tissues. And one of the difficulties there is, although uh, you can deliver into the liver and you can deliver to the kidney and those types of organs relatively uh, efficiently. Getting them targeted to the tumor is a bit of a problem. And I wonder whether we may be getting some threshold effects going on here where you get a graded knockdown of target, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. And depending upon the amount of knockdown of the target, you can get contrary effects at low knockdown, whereas you may get very uh, efficient effects at high knockdown. And we may be getting into some real difficulties over here. And I do know that in the antisense oligonucleotide world, this is something that, that yeah. companies like ISIS are wrestling with enormously to try to, to, try to target their agent more effectively to the, to the tumors themselves. Are there any further questions? If not, thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you. And, uh,